Calling all vegans. Retro Remix. With our first guest, I am going to have to try really hard not to fangirl because this ethologist, author, and fish myth buster, try saying that three times, that one three times quickly, <laughs> is someone I really admire. And I know Mary Finelli of Fish Feel feels the same. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Belcom to Culling All Vegans. Hi. Hi. So, not too many oceans in Belleville, Ontario, huh? No, but we do have Lake Ontario. There you go. Let me just start off by saying that fish are very special to me. Um, I was a kid who made animals my priority and would become enraged if someone harmed any animal, including an insect. Yet for some crazy reason, I went fishing a few times as a child. Um, drowning and suffocating petrify me, yet I inflicted that misery on another being. It's one of my great regrets in life, but it's also left me with unlimited space in my heart for our, our aquatic friends. Um, you were obviously a kid who loved animals, bugs included. Can you tell us about eight-year-old John, Johnny, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, well, he had the innocence and naivete of most young people. And uh, when I got into that rowboat to go out fishing at summer camp with the camp director, I it didn't think ahead to what I might see or witness and when I did see what happened to the fish pulled out of the lake uh, I was really disturbed and concerned uh, I as a kid growing up I've always kind of put myself into their place and yeah. had that strong empathy gene I guess so I was quite upset by what I saw and when I tried to fish by myself and had to put the worms on the hooks and pull them out of the fish I, I lost any interest I had originally had Absolutely. Well, and I always felt sorry for the worms and everybody. We would have been great friends as little kids, I think. We would, would have got along just fine. Would you say that that was one of the uh, first things that kind of led you towards your, uh, your path towards a, a vegan lifestyle? You know, it's hard to connect those things when they're so far apart because I was 25 before I became vegetarian and several years after that before I went fully plant-based. But uh, I think those formative experiences are, you know, they stay with us. I, I have vivid memories of that occasion, as I do from certain other occasions involving animals from my childhood. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a bi-directional. I, I think one could say that those experiences maybe have led, led to my becoming vegan. I don't know why I didn't make the connection earlier than I did, you know, in my mid-20s. Uh, but I was a, a student by then at university, graduate student, and I encountered some of the writings of uh, American philosopher, animal rights philosopher, Tom Reagan. And he wrote an essay in particular called The Moral Basis of Vegetarianism. And when I read that article, it was sort of like this thinking was so clear and it was sort of nascent in my mind but I'd never really worked it through mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, it was completely uh, logical to me so there was no turning back from then that was a writer I think I may have actually become vegetarian just before that but I hadn't thought it through and yeah. it was really uh, validating to see these logical arguments presented before me by a great thinker and a superb writer and uh, it made me very feel very comfortable in that decision that I'd made my first activism probably was as a kid when I expressed uh, my objections to people stepping on ants and things like that. Oh, but um, I went on a, an anti-fur march in Toronto when I was in my teens, and that was maybe the beginning of my activism. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it just gradually increased from there. And once I was done with grad school, I, I mean, I did campaign my university to give students a choice in dis whether or not they had to dissect frogs and fetal pigs. So mm -hmm. I guess that was my first real personal campaign. When most people think of fish, it's how to serve them on a plate, not really in consideration of their rich emotional lives. Far more fish are exploited than any other category of animals. They are subjected to the worst abuses, yet they have the least legal protection and receive the least concern for their well-being, even from the animal protection community. Um, so basically people are just indifferent to their suffering. There are astronomical numbers killed each and every year, and estimates range from 150 billion to 3 trillion most dying in such horrible, inhumane ways as suffocation, crushing, decompression, etc. Why this lack of stewardship and how should one fairly describe fishes? I think the, the answer to the question as to why we, why we kind of missed the boat, uh, yeah. my turn for a pun, on fishing, yeah. but is, a that, is that uh, we are physically alienated from them. We have been through our history in the sense that 
we live on land, we breathe air, so do all the other vertebrates except fishes. They live in another environment under the water. Yeah. They um, are out of our view. We can look across a lake or an ocean, and there may be thousands of fish within inches of, of that surface, but we can't see them. Out of sight, and out it, of mind kind of thing, huh? Yeah, and the fact that when we do see them, we see a very different creature, a, a slimy-skinned, uh, as you say, cold, staring eyes. You know, they don't need to blink. They, their eyes are bathed in water all the time, yeah. so they don't need eyelids. <laughs> In fact, fishes sometimes, some fishes I think do have some protective lids that they can put over their eyes, but they, they swivel their eyes. They have the same six eye muscles that we have. Um, they make sounds, but their sounds are for propagation underwater and we largely don't hear them. So I think it's this physical alienation that has prejudiced us against them through history. And it's only in the last 50, 60, 70 years with the advent of scuba gear and underwater photography and cinematography that we've been able to really appreciate the complexity and the detail, the nuances of their of their private social lives and realize that, wow, these are actually full members of the vertebrate group. They're just as complex as any other group as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it was one of the most joyous things of my life to research and write this book because there were continual discoveries that I was excited about bringing to light because a lot of this stuff just ends up in scientific journals and doesn't make it out to the public's mind. We have this whole untapped universe, more or less, right on our own planet, you know? Like, it's like a, a, a final frontier of sorts, the mm -hmm. oceans. It is. There's so much uh, exciting discovery to be had. You know, when you see the, the thing, um, you know, people, someone gazing, it's like a, it's kind of a cult cultural me meme, a trope, gazing out into space. Are we alone? The question, like, <laughs> are we alone? I know what they're saying, like, I mean, but, but, but really, we're so not alone. I mean, there's so much fantastic... Exactly other beings on this planet and I think we should be very lucky that we live on this rich planet and so many other creatures to to gaze at and appreciate and interact with. I've learned that uh, we love stories, all of us are drawn in by stories so I've learned to interview people to get personal accounts to relay some of my own personal experiences essentially to include stories um, that really uh, engage readers interest. Obviously they need to be relevant and pertinent but uh, so it's a combination of the science to get to here, but the stories uh, do much more to get to the heart. That's right. Uh, to get to our tap into our emotions. And readers who are emotionally affected either through humor or sadness or some other emotion, uh, there is science to show that they are going to be much more receptive to the, to the uh, message. Can you talk to us a touch about how fish use tools uh this is something that you know would be completely foreign to to most people that haven't uh, read a, on the topic yeah it's kind of hard to imagine a fish with a hammer in one fin and a <laughs> nail in the other right of course they don't they don't do that but uh, they don't have the tool they don't have their own physical tools to use tools in that manner they don't have manipulative hands however they have a mouth they have a good brain uh, and they have flexible thinking and, in some cases, creativity. Uh, the best example of tool use in a fish that I've, I've seen is uh, with a, a tusk fish, and there's some other species that do similar behavior. Um, they will use water as a tool to blow water on the substrate on the bottom to get sand off to uncover, say, a mollusk, a clam. Oh, yeah. And then using their mouth, they'll pick the clam up and swim to... And you can watch YouTube videos of this behavior. They'll swim to probably a known predetermined rock or piece of coral that they will then use as, a, as an anvil mm. to whack uh, the unfortunate mollusk against with a series of repeated head flicks and releases, very well coordinated. Take a walnut, mm -hmm. a, a walnut in the shell and into a swimming pool sometime and try and smash it against the wall of the pool you. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't come up with the word stream, but you came up with the word bolus, so full respect. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> no, it, um, an interview wouldn't be anything without the word bolus. <laughs> <laughs> I love learning more about these wondrous creatures, but not via the horrible ways that they're studied. Um, although I would hate for those studies not to be cited after the fact because it feels disrespectful that the fish suffered for nothing. Um, I feel the, kind of feel the same way when people throw meat in the garbage, you know, it, it's that whole idea of adding insult to injury. Um, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, it's a dilemma, isn't it? I mean, yeah. uh, a lot of the studies that I research and cite in my writings, uh, you know, I mean, and credit to the creative, innovative scientists who do the studies, but a lot of those studies are not very nice for the fish. Uh, yeah, some of them are terrible. lethal, some of them cause suffering and stress and the like. 
But as you say, uh, given that it's not in my power to stop those studies, uh, right. it may be my, in my power to exert some influence on the future course of scientific studies. But by citing them, I think we can elevate the respect uh, and awareness of what these animals are capable of. So um, in that uh, doing the best with a, a non-ideal situation, I, I will definitely uh, use those studies to try and build the animal's case for future reference. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've always gravitated to unpopular animals. I, I studied bats for my graduate work way back when, and I almost ended up studying snakes, which are a, a favorite of mine. So maybe there's that element in there. But it's not like we don't like fish. It's just that we just treat them ab abysmally, partly because of those biases that we touched on earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but but th this this particular book, this subject had had the ingredients that I look for for an ideal topic for a book. One is that. There's a lot of really amazing science that we so there's a lot of a lot of great knowledge that we have. One, two, uh, most people are unaware of this knowledge, and three, we treat the animals that we're talking about uh, really poorly. And as, as Sue mentioned at the beginning of the interview, the, the numbers are, are astronomical and mm -hmm. the treatment is appalling. Absolutely. So those are all the kind of ingredients that I think lend themselves well to the subject of the book. Dolphin safe tuna. Um, that really does speak volumes about how people feel about fish. Uh, what would yeah. you have to say to that? Yeah, no yeah. affront to dolphins. I mean, they're yeah. they're wonderful, and we we, yeah. we love them. You know, we tend to appreciate. It. Of course, we abuse them as well, but we uh, we 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 ha we connect better with them because they're fellow mammals. They communicate in ways that we can recognize a little bit better. Uh, yeah, dolphin safe tuna, tuna. I mean, what about the tuna, right? Exactly. No, no such thing as a tuna safe tuna campaign. And tunas are, as I mentioned, usually in my talks, I show a picture of a tuna. You know, I mean, these animals, the biggest species, grow up to uh, a high end of uh, 1,500 pounds. Oh my and God. Um, they uh, can swim faster than a tiger can run, and they live longer, and they hunt cooperatively. I mean, they're complex apex predators. They're marvelous creatures. And we reduce them to these little anonymous cans on the sh uh, stacked on the supermarket shelves. And I remember as a kid seeing those. and still see them and uh, having no clue what a tuna was I figured it was like a sardine yeah again yeah. not to take anything away from a little fish like a no. sardine <laughs> who swims in schools and probably has all kinds of complex behavior but uh, but just different we, that's all they deserve so much more respect than we give them well Absolutely. then actually uh, here's some of my questions that I had thrown aside because you uh, had said you had to get to your piano lesson but <laughs> I did want to mention now though that um, you say that a tuna is closer to a human than to a shark uh, by about two million years, so there's another little uh, boost for <laughs> tuna. Yeah, and I can't take the credit for that. It was someone else who did the did the yeah, genetic research on that. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, of course that, that, that that's an intrinsically anthropocentric comment. Yeah, and here we go. <laughs> because it it kind of underscores the notion that we are the important one and everything's measured according to us. And right. I know that the three of us don't subscribe to that way of thinking, but. But uh, isn't it interesting that we, we're, we're interested in pointing out and how closely related they are to us? Well, it's more like a nah, nah, nah to people who, uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, are trying to just dismiss, dismiss it. Them, yeah. yeah. I, I've got to ask you. Two words. Two words. Herring flatulence. <laughs> Herring flatulence, yes. Uh, yeah, it's uh, one of the uh, more comical studies done. But uh, it also points to a very interesting communication system among herrings. It's not fully yeah. understood, but you know these are, are large. They form large schools. They form small fish form large schools, and uh, they migrate. Uh, they move from different parts of the water column at different times of day for safety reasons. And uh, I'm not quite sure. I don't recall the nuances of it, but. Uh, uh, they've evolved this uh, method of communicating uh, by remit emitting bubbles of gas from their swim bladders through their anuses, and it's a uh, this a scientist who studied it. It makes a sound, and they mm -hmm. refer to it as frequent repetitive ticks. I'll let I'll let uh, viewers <laughs> figure out the acronym for that. But uh, yes, essentially More fish bedumpum. farting to communicate, and they can do it for seven seven seconds straight. So wow. I encourage you to try that at home. Full respect. Huh? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think uh, my wife will take that as an, a, an example for communication. No. Um, <laughs> just tell her doing herring research. I can, I can burp the alphabet. So. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> can we just talk about your upcoming book? Not uh, Minding Nemo, but the other one. <laughs> Uh, like I had mentioned before, I've always been drawn to the more maligned or demonized species, and flies definitely fall into that category. 
Can you give us a little peekaboo into the world of flies? We talked a little bit about it in our messaging. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've always been uh, fascinated by insects. Far and away the most successful group of animals on Earth. About 80%, about 8 out of 10 of all animals on this planet is an insect. Uh, in terms of species diversity, in terms of individual numbers, it's probably higher than that. And uh, But because insects are such a successful and diverse group, I, I felt it might be overwhelming to try and take them on as a whole. Yeah. So I decided to pick one subgroup. Uh, so I chose a very unpopular commonly disliked uh, angst producing which I think is a plus <laughs> we have we, we you know how many people who are listening or to this have not had a mosquito try and bite them well that's a fly mosquitoes are, are in the fly group there's about a hundred and sixty thousand described species of flies so they're immensely diverse there may be as many as five or more times as many as that number based on sampling of, of, of habitats in the wild my book is a sort of a survey of the fascinating lives of these creatures I'm on a mission, though. I'm always on a mission. I'm, I mean, I'm an advocate of all animals, and right. flies are no exception. Obviously, okay. you know, I mean, I've had my uh, my confrontations with mosquitoes and deer flies and black flies and horse flies and the like. Uh, but um, overall, my message of the, in this book is that we 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 need flies. We need diversity. We need biodiversity. They are a crucial part of ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Without them, we wouldn't be here to have the discussion. So. Yeah. While we may go to ba go to battle with yes. certain mosquitoes and such like that, we do need to be uh, mindful that uh, we need the uh, diversity here to have on Earth, and we need to uh, have a have an understanding relationship with all other creatures. Absolutely. Well, and they don't uh, they don't need us as much as we need them. That's for sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. There are some flies uh, who are an exception to most species in that they would lament the disappearance of humans because <laughs> we're a big feeding habitat for some of them. But but most flies uh, would probably be cheering from the sidelines. Yeah. Um, not that I'm an advocate of the disappearance of humans. Far from it. I'm I'm one of them myself, and I advocate for my species in many yeah. many regards. Uh, but the flip side isn't the case. Flies would flourish without us, but we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to survive without them. Yeah. I always like to ask the, the hardest hitting questions. And, um, and so hopefully you're prepared for this. By, by going vegan and, and embracing a plant-based lifestyle, you've increased your likelihood of winding up on a desert island by approximately 900% with an animal companion pig. That being said, if you had only had one, one dish that you were going to choose to have with you, what would that dish be? Uh. <laughs> You know, a good paella is hard to beat. I like pasta as well, so maybe a, a pasta with a marinara and mushroom sauce would be mm. one of my favorites. The pig would be welcome to share it with me, but definitely wouldn't be on the menu. Well, yeah, Absolutely. But, well, he gets to, he or she gets to have their own choice as yeah. well. So. The, the okay. good well, a little truffle oil added to that would be oh. welcome. <laughs> well. Now you're getting a little bit greedy. <laughs> Calling all vegans. Retro Remix! <laughs>